So what I want to talk about is focusing oriented democracy. And as you can see on the slide, it can go by various names, inner democracy, embodied democracy, experiential democracy, and newer ones I've thought of today were vulnerable democracy, deep process democracy, or listening democracy. So I'd like to sketch out two things. First, how focusing and FOT can be seen as a kind of inner democracy. And secondly, how these practices could help us to model a new kind of community or outer democracy. Focusing with oneself already suggests a particular kind of democracy. One where all inner voices matter, not just the loud ones, where there must be some kind of consensus rather than majority rule democracy, where we escape from the dictatorship of the I or the self or me as I think I am. We also add the first person perspective into our social processing. At the moment with social media, our social world comes from the spectator view, judging others only on the explicit content. I would like to suggest that what we know from focusing offers a process of democracy that could be constructively upscaled and shared with a world that needs more of the implicit process that we already value. So I want to start with the end. Uh, so you have an idea where I'm hoping to get to. The process of listening is a natural way to evoke a focusing process for non-focusers. It's one of the things I've come to. Teaching listening rather than focusing in order for people to learn focusing. Emphasizing process rather than content is our special contribution. Focusers and FOTs could organize large-scale free listening training as a way to bridge polarization. FOTs can offer a different kind of activism, a kind of process activism. Teaching listening is probably more generally accessible than teaching focusing. Listening demonstrates how a point of view can naturally shift without being argued against and contradicted. Some years ago, we had a World Day of Listening that a number of focusing people participated in. Many untrained listeners also participated. But it didn't empower the public to listen, just to speak. So maybe we need a kind of listening core, like the Peace Corps, where people learn how to listen to each other. I want to suggest that as therapists, we do have a special responsibility to not just join in politics the same way we would have if we'd never trained as therapists. We know about experiencing and therapy as a process, and we can spread that knowing. Jendlin wanted to give therapy away. Now let's give listening away. There is a cliche of being the change we want to see in the world. I think that's fundamental. If you imagine the world the way you'd like it to be, you can also imagine a way of achieving that that is consistent with the goal. People will believe in a movement that practices what it preaches. People must be able to feel that they are already a part of something better on the way to making things better.
I'd like to invite you to just imagine your society as you would like it to be. How do people interact and behave towards themselves, others, the planet? What would we value in that imagined world? What would motivate us on a daily basis? How would we navigate competing ideas, conflicts, misunderstandings? What would the purpose of life be in such a world? Imagining a better world gives us the chance to work backwards from an ideal to practice in the present. In the present, we can sense action steps that take us towards greater involvement in the wider world as FOTs and as focusers. and to begin to think of the focusing process itself as a model for, one, how to organize ourselves, and two, how to build a form of community that is consistent with the living process that makes us vital. And three, Think of the focusing process itself as a model for the fundamental behavior we need to keep democracies functioning. Let's also be clear that we're not denying the need for safe environments to explore ourselves honestly. That takes some degree of safety. We can't easily expose the vulnerable or unwanted aspects of our being when we already feel under attack. And there's so much attacking in the social world today. I think that goes for all of us. We all need some degree of safety. So what are we doing to help create safe enough spaces in our interactions? Let's also acknowledge that the world is not a neutral or equal starting place. It's full of pre-existing biases and prejudices and unjust hierarchies. And of course, these also have an impact on our lived experience. The focusing process needs yet also makes a degree of safety by teaching us how to find a grounded resilience and trust in a robust process that knows about the world. Is there anything we could begin to do right now that would be a step towards the world we can imagine? I have five points, and so this is point number one. To be consistent, we must first begin with our own process. I think we see this style of focusing oriented democracy best if we begin with a form of clearing a space. This is a practice we can do for ourselves continually and with clients and in public. It already shows us many important facets of focusing. We need to start without any agenda, apart from a desire to be in relational contact with all of myself. We're not trying to be compassionate or good 
or righteous. We're not trying to atone for sins, conform to an imposed set of ideas. We're not trying to maximize our potential, achieve peace. We are not trying to convince or control ourselves. This clearing of space is not oppressing or rejecting any part of us, no matter how it appears. No subtle rejection or even sneaky attempt to make me change. When we pay attention to our living, do we find some kind of unified whole inside? I would claim that most of us find many parts, concerns, areas of different sensation, a diverse community, even with competing and contradictory impulses, feelings, and points of view. We are not coherent oneness. In our experience, we have probably all noticed that we have vulnerable parts, parts with courage, parts that always resist, insecure parts. We may feel ashamed of some of them, even try to annihilate them. However, to be whole in this sense is to be inclusive rather than unified. Since it doesn't work to just delete parts we don't like, a focusing attitude shows us that it's better to hear each part and acknowledge its message. Most of us know that each part of ourselves carries some wisdom that we're yet to understand. Do we have that same attitude towards parts of our external community? What would I be like if I could openly listen to all parts of myself with equal regard? What qualities do you imagine I would have? Clearing a space means guiding you through a process something like this. First, I would encourage you to get some space between you and whatever you're carrying around from your life at this moment. Then I'd invite you to notice if there are any parts of you there. For example, a part that feels a little critical of how your day is going. part that is always impatient or that tries too hard. Can you also take some time to expand the space of you so that you can welcome each part of you? <clears throat> See if you can welcome all of you to come into a clearing, a space, an opening, while you become the space that welcomes and witnesses all of you. Each aspect of you gets a place, no matter how loud or quiet. Each is invited to sit comfortably. This is the beginning of an inner democracy. Even as I describe it, you might begin to feel slightly more spacious, slightly more welcoming of yourself and beginning to notice that you are more than any of the content. I would ask you, would you like the community of you to include all of you or only some parts of you? That might be a very important question. What quality would I like my inner community to have? What atmosphere or environment 
would I like to establish inside of me? Now, if it feels okay, imagine that the kind of community you want on the inside could also exist in groups you belong to. What would that be like? How would it feel if you were in that kind of community inside and outside? What parts of you would shine freshly? What would come alive in you? So what I'm suggesting is becoming a relational witness for the community of me. Clearing a space to connect with life process, not just life content. Identifying with the continuity of space rather than current concerns or parts of us. This inner community is inclusive and diverse. How do we access the holding environment that's needed for this level of self-acceptance? Next, I want to just outline the phenomenological process as it's found in existential psychotherapy, for example. And I'm not even arguing for, but just wanting to point out that it's the same as the essence of the focusing process. First of all, we suspend all assumptions and judgments of what we think we know. That's in phenomenology. We try to bracket off everything we think we know, our assumptions, our preconceptions, our judgments, in order to be open and friendly to what's there. We do the same thing in focus. The second step of the phenomenological process is that we stay at the level of description. We do exactly the same in focusing. We don't interpret, we don't impose pre-existing ideas on what we feel. We let the feeling describe itself in words or images. Phenomenology also stays right at that level of description. The third point in the phenomenological process is that we treat all aspects of experience equally. We don't decide beforehand what's important and what isn't. We don't take sides and label one thing resistance because it's in the way of something else. Everything's treated equally. And that's partly because we have already bracketed off all of the theories and preconceptions that would give us any basis to know how to set up an, a hierarchy in our experiencing. For that reason, we just treat everything equally because we have no basis upon which to take sides. The difference is that there's a fourth step in focusing where we add this zigzag of remaining grounded in the bodily process as we experience it and as it continues to shift and carry itself along and go from the process to the symbolizing, back to the process, to the symbolizing, back to the process. That's not usual in phenomenology, although I would say it should be, that focusing experientializes this phenomenological process. So in summary so far, I want to suggest that we have the ability to adapt a phenomenological way of being. Or the focusing attitude, which means setting down content and closely held identities in order to be with them rather than to reify them as the concrete me. We can approach each aspect of self equally, 
no evaluation of good or bad, or right or wrong, or progress versus resistance. Or if there is an evaluation, we just welcome that as another part. We're listening for the feeling or the felt senses point of view, not our opinion of it. This is a description of the process of phenomenology. We adopt this attitude, not in order to be a good person or to push some oppressive kindness onto the space. We bring it honestly to our experience because it's what experience needs. The second point, everything is process. It helps to not treat my inner content as a fixed entity, but instead a stuck process wanting to be freed back into its flow. For some reason, your relational awareness helps any content to feel more alive and conscious of itself, and thereby you participate in content's implicit effort to return to process. From focusing, we know that if you can attend to anything in your experience in an open and accepting way, you soon notice that the feeling shifts and changes as you stay with it and try to sense it. Often words, images, memories spontaneously come. Yet experience is always more than your understanding or your symbolizing. It's a process that interacts with words, images, concepts. But it always remains more than any of those explicit outputs. None of this is new to you as focusers, though it is very new to clients and to the general public. So in summary, for some reason, I think that's interesting, that for some reason, our open awareness plus our felt experience gives us the kind of space that makes feelings come alive. Why is that? Units begin to return to process, you could say. Focusing attitude, phenomenological attitude, helps us to trust the experiential process, even though it is based upon unknowing and uncertainty. The process does not mean instability. It offers a living ground, ordered movement, as an alternative to having to anchor ourselves to fixed ideas, conclusions, and ideologies. The metaphoric as if quality of stiff symbolizing helps protect the process so that it does not get pinned down into conclusions. So you can see I got carried away with the transitions. So this is a kind of a summary again. We're experimenting with being a community of process, not a fixed self. We start with an attitude of unknowing and uncertainty. What is this all really about? This is basic focusing. 
You are not groundless. It is just that the real grounding offered is a shifting ground. But it shifts according to an intricate order. It's not an avalanche or an earthquake. Like many people fear it is. Attending to lived experience is the prerequisite for meaning and sense-making. Focusing, or something like it, should strengthen individuals to think for and from themselves. The entire philosophical project is to strengthen the concept of lived experience that cannot be substituted by theory, rules, or ideology. If we prioritize process, we take each utterance metaphorically. We want the as-if quality to be protected so that the openness to process remains. Taking the explicit utterance as metaphor rather than fact or conclusion. The symbol is a metaphor. It's as if I'm a child. It's as if I'm down by the lake with my feet in the cold water. It's as if there's a kind of loneliness. Prioritizing process means that experiencing moving forward is more important than understanding or explaining something once and for all. The carrying forward is understanding rather than conceptual grasping as understanding. A person captured by fixed beliefs has a prejudice towards knowing everything beforehand. This can undermine how the process of experience allows us to think for ourselves. But you must have some access to and some trust in your own felt experience in order to withstand imposed conclusions. But this does not mean that your felt experience itself becomes a kind of fundamentalism of the first person experience. Like it's my experience, therefore it must be accepted as true. Your experience is more complex than any attempt to pin it down as a claim on the world. Process cannot be reified. If we can be open to the diversity and not try to resolve it, be open to the uncertainty and not knowing what it's all about beforehand, then experience comes alive in a process of change. You are not a collection of preset arguments inside. A rigidly held theory, dogma, doctrine, the kind of rigidity that we find in social and political life. They give us an answer to everything. And anything that does not fit into that belief structure is wrong, rather than a useful elaboration. The more that we value in focusing constantly gets trimmed off and discarded. Gendlin used to say, never finish the sentence, I am a... Canadian psychologist, foreigner. 
the struggle at the moment in many of our democratic societies is a struggle between ideologies, each trying to replace the other. But no ideology is radical enough. We need to replace ideology with process because process by its nature can never become ideology cannot be fixed or pinned down. And it's consistent with what we are. Prioritizing process allows us to sense a rightness of direction that eventually shows us authentic ways to act. It's my, my claim. So the third of the five points is pausing. Pausing allows us to bracket all of the usual ways, as we've already said. It gives us space to be uncertain. Uncertainty is not a failure to know. We can celebrate uncertainty as an accomplishment it protects the living process itself. To remain uncertain is not always easy. Pausing allows the radical shift from self-awareness to other awareness, giving time to move into the act of listening. Pausing makes me alive to my process while all also sensitive to the process in the other. And this we know as therapists. So I'd like to invite you to just pause and to consider. Think of a time when you personally stood up and took a stand that felt important to you. Maybe in a group or an online meeting or something smaller in the family, or a small group of friends or colleagues. If you can remember such a situation where you stood up and took a stand, can you pause now and sense what it was like inside at that moment? Remember it vividly enough that you can pause and really get a feeling of it again. Even though you took a stand and expressed yourself, was there also another part? Maybe something that was a bit worried, wary or scared, for example? If so, can you feel into what allowed you to act on the side that wanted to speak up? There was two parts there potentially or more. What allows you to act from the part of you that stood up and took a stand? Now I'd like you to pause and think of a time when you wanted to make a difference or express yourself, but you stayed quiet. You wanted to say something, but you didn't. What kept you from following through? Again, was there more than one part of you being felt in that moment? When you think of it now, can you feel what you would have liked to have said or done? What really would have worked for you, given the complexity of the situation and your feelings? And can you sense why in this situation you acted on the wanting to stay quiet 
rather than the wanting to speak. If you think of situations when you feel that someone or something is trying to prevent you from really being yourself, how do you respond? Do you rebel? Do you acquiesce? Or do you find a way through somehow? find the living impulse, we need to pause our conventions, habits, and patterns to fall out of the imposed routine and return to the phenomenological space. Pausing is crucial. So the fourth point. The kind of thinking we're practicing is the opposite of socially imposed thinking or parroting some established point of view. We're talking about a kind of embodied thinking that follows pausing. And it has the idiosyncratic person as its source, whatever a person is. Each person's unique way of thinking can express who they really are right then. Do we want to welcome that in each other or not? Do we need every person's uniqueness or only some people's? The felt meaning underneath our thinking is not just personal. It's a personal opening to the whole situation. And so it has information for all of us. From the perspective of focusing-oriented democracy, could we treat each part of another person with the same equality and respect to try to treat each part of ourselves? Can we allow within and between diverse voices valuing different points of view for the untold story that they contain? All of this does not deny that our openness and gentleness towards the self and other might meet a kind of brutal certainty at the public level. How can we stand up for uncertain experiential process when confronted by something so solid and so certain? Being listened to facilitates new thinking even about old assumptions. We need to be able to listen from the body, but also to think from the body in order to engage in the democracy I'm describing. It can be satisfying to listen to another so that they clarify their thinking in new ways, even if we really disagree with their thinking it can still be satisfying. Rigidly held ideas could be seen as the preface to a story that is yet to be told. The opening position on a topic is not the full story. As FOTs, we already practice this precision of attending to our bodily responses while listening to another person as they think and express. Our felt sensing guides us into deeper and deeper levels of listening to the subtleties of interaction as both people become more deeply alive. It's just a quote from Jendlin and this is from the discovery of felt meaning in 1966. What is there in us which makes us so hesitant to confront our felt meanings and use them? What scares us so that we cling 
to our constructs only, that we find comfort in limiting ourselves to grinding out implications from given ideas only. I believe that it is our failures at living and the poor quality of the human being which we so often feel we really are underneath. Yet this is no reason to turn away. And the quote continues. In class, in psychotherapy, in friendship, for example, what counts is not the quality of human being I am or my wisdom. What counts is whether I will be a human being with people. If I will be a human being, I can only be the one I am. But fortunately, this need not be so great or good or wise. It needs only to be a human being, and this we all are. I feel like that has become lost, that sentiment. Obviously, I'm concerned with the potential for upscaling, focusing, and FOT to address polarization and rigid ideas. So it might be useful just to reflect, reflect briefly on our own political opinions. So I'm just inviting you to reflect on where did your politics come from? Family, friends, books, teachers, communities, taught theories. Where did your politics come from? How have they changed over the years and what changed them? Is your own felt experience always consistent with your expressed political opinions? If not, do you respect or at least do you express or at least respect both contradictory parts? You may be able to respect but not express it, or you may be able to do both. Do you try to believe something that part of you is not totally on board with? And why would you do that if you do? In our current societies, the citizen is often treated as a baby with transference reactions to the powerful authorities of society. But maybe we could flip this so that the citizen is seen as a kind of therapeutic source, a parental figure to the society. Not the victim of the system, but the body wisdom that the system needs in order to keep progressing creatively. Why focusing-oriented democracy? Can't we just work with clients and leave it at that? This is our fifth, my fifth and final point. Political content is no longer in contact with experiential process. It's mostly just imposed. That's one of my experiences or assumptions. As FOTs, we actually have a practice that we could share outside our consulting rooms in a consistent line from the inner to the interpersonal to the community. A lot of forms of therapy don't have as clear a practice. Therapy language has spread into the public domain, like untriggered or my trauma, but not as a therapy process. It's been imported as language. Can we bring the compassionate space and pausing and listening it supports 
into more public discourse? Can we bring the process? So I don't think there's much, if anything, in what I've said so far that's new to practicing FOTs, except I'm using different metaphors in order to suggest a continuity from the inner to the interpersonal and then the external community. Why? There's three main reasons. One is there are now forms of therapy training which use critical political perspectives as a mode of analysis rather than the open exploratory therapy that we have long known in existential humanistic approaches. Working existentially, we have never separated the person from their environment and never assumed that the person is some self-enclosed subject with psychopathology that needs to be repaired. The new political perspectives in therapy training rightly emphasize the social and cultural impact that each of us must live within. But then these therapies impose their own analysis onto the client, much like psychoanalysis used to do. They miss how each client responds to and lives their situation uniquely. And by exploring their unique take on life, we learn more than any theory. In the book Cynical Therapies, an international collection of therapists express their concerns about the therapist becoming a political activist in terms of ideological content. The focusing-oriented democracy I'm suggesting avoids imposing content on the client while keeping a progressive therapeutic process at its heart. The metaphors of focusing-oriented democracy imply a practice that emphasizes inner and interpersonal diversity, relational attunement, and the power of listening without oppression. Therapy language has spread on social media, but it seems to be mostly the language that's taken up, not the therapy process. Words like trauma or triggered can be used quasi-therapeutically, but often with the intention of closing down discussion. Focusing oriented democracy can emphasize how change comes from staying with difficult and uncomfortable experiences rather than seeing difficulty as something to avoid. Okay, that's the five points I wanted to make. Now just to review self as an inclusive space not hijacked by a partial self or one overriding concern the need to pause and adopt a focusing attitude keeping an attitude of metaphor rather than fact it's as if or it's like the power of listening without an agenda even when not agreeing those four conditions hold the opportunity to become aware of self as process. These conditions also help us to actually think generatively together. To say I know myself is a way of concretizing myself as a thing that can be known. But I can claim that I know how to know myself. It's a process, not an achievement. How can you know something that's still forming and still unfinished? 
and we embrace the openness of unknowing even ourselves. For the review, just two more points. A democracy should be alive like a person is, like a therapy session is, following a process that carries forward rather than one that is imposed. Could we have a social carrying forward rather than a stoppage that's imposed every four to five years? How? Very different conception of democracy. And the last review point, an oppressive process will always achieve an oppressive outcome, no matter how wonderful the goals are. So we need a process that already has the values of the world we want. And this is from Gene Gendlin in a little paper he wrote, what kind of organization fits with focusing, which he shared with the focusing community. How can people organize themselves in a different way? The great movements of the 20th century all failed around this issue. Whatever their ideal and aims, the mode of organization was always the same. And that, not the ideals, determined what really happened. Focusing in everything that it opens should lead to a different mode for people to organize. Is there some level of organizing where we have to just give up on what we know works experientially and just import pre-existing structures and traditional assumptions about how things work? Is there a size of group interaction where focusing oriented democracy no longer works? If so, what is that size? Five people and it no longer works? Ten? One hundred? Where does it break down? I think the problem isn't that it's not workable at a larger community level. I think the problem is we haven't discovered how to do it yet. We may find that there is a better way at some level of organizing, but let's at least test that. Let's test a kind of democracy that is far more robust and also welcomes far more vulnerability. More robust because there's an experiential ground that can be returned to over and over. More robust because decisions that are arrived at after hearing each part of each person, should have the feeling of rightness to them. Therefore, the agreed action is much more likely to be carried out. It doesn't have to be constantly revisited or half resisted because it only resonates with part of myself or only 51% of the group. Most of us here probably identify as progressive or left-leaning politically. It's not easy to find a psychotherapist who would identify as right-wing or even as very conservative. For that reason, it's very tempting to just read our values into experience as if they're already there. But let's try to remain phenomenological. Still, perhaps there is something in the values of the therapeutic process itself that seem more consistent with liberal attitudes of openness, acceptance, tolerance, equality, social justice, reducing suffering. Maybe the process already has values like that in it. If so, then maybe the process of focusing provides us with another way to be progressive while preventing us from imposing content upon process, which I would consider very conservative, not at all progressive. Obstacles? <laughs> One obstacle. We're not strong enough alone. 
and we can't find enough others to form a supportive group to offer listening to others whose opinions are hard to hear. Who do we start with? How do we start? Another obstacle. We actually lose the support of people that we normally ally with in social and political terms because we sound too neutral and end up more isolated rather than more supportive. Another obstacle. We have to stick up for something that sounds abstract or too therapeutic or uncertain or vulnerable or flimsy attitudes that can't meet the aggressive certainty outside. And some people will not be interested in listening or being listened to when being angry and combative feels more satisfying, they think. We need to acknowledge that the focusing or FOT world also does not include enough diversity now. Can we start by introducing our practice to underrepresented minority groups in our own communities? That's a very good place to start. And the last obstacle, do I really expect a focusing and listening revolution to save democracy? How naive. Final points. What alternative do we have? As we know, parts create each other. This also applies to our polarized societies. Trying to silence opposing points of view just makes them more aggressive and more extreme. It doesn't work. We need to redefine democracy as a listening culture where we want to achieve more consensus than domination, even if we're convinced that our ideas are the right ones. It's got to be something more important than our right ideas. Don't reduce a person to their point of view. Then we're stuck in competing tribes, whereas focusing emphasizes our universal values of being human. We need to reintroduce vulnerability and uncertainty as sacred values that do not just concede weakness and failure. This was spray painted on a wall in Brighton. Our problem is civil obedience. Jenlin spoke of the dangers of the obedience pattern which this person obviously knows about. But the disobedience pattern is also problematic. It goes nowhere. We've moved past just conforming or just rebelling. So what kind of pattern do we most need in the world today? And at the very end, possible small steps towards focusing-oriented democracy, a social movement bringing focusing into the public arena by teaching public listening, an FOT conference on this topic, using focusing and listening to develop a strategy, That's different strategies, not just one, maybe set up listening teams, maybe organize a movement along these principles. But again, the movement has to be an instance of the principles. Begin to offer free public listening training events. Reach out to groups underrepresented in the focusing world to teach focusing and listening. Find allies in the world of psychotherapy. Support each other in this task of shifting culture towards the values of FOT. Don't leave anyone on their own. Okay, that's it. Thank you.